So we thought we'd try to begin and, and allow the doctors to have the, the full time here. Um, in a few minutes, uh, Dr. Maynard will be passing around these yellow question pages. And uh, we're asking if you have any questions, if you could jot them down, and someone will come around and, and pick them up as, as you get them done. Have patience. We're not sure who's just going to be doing that. Um, and then we will try to get to as many of these questions at the end. I imagine uh, that many of you have had to ignore pain at least once or if not every day of your life since you've had polio. And sometimes we don't really do anything about it and then it gets worse and worse. I can remember about 15 years ago one of my co-workers asked me, what does your pain feel like? I was really taken aback. No one had ever asked me what did it feel like. And then when I started thinking about it, because I always kind of suppressed thinking about it, well, it didn't always feel the same. And frankly, I just lumped everything in together and I said, oh, that's probably polio. But we know that even that isn't always the same. But now I realize the importance of knowing what kind of pain it is, where it is, the causes, and possible aids. And in this session, we hope that you will have opportunities to also recognize and learn and get answers in some of these questions. Doctors Fred Maynard and William DeMeo are both extremely qualified experts in uh, polio and its late effects. Both have worked extensively with Post Polio Health International uh, they've served on committees and other advisory uh, positions. Dr. Maynard uh, is the one that writes the, the Q&A section in uh, the PHI newsletters and often uh, meets with the polio groups around the country to discuss various aspects and also uh, has um, set up and worked in a number of retreats. Dr. DeMeo is a leader at the Connemar Health Systems over in, uh, well, I'm moving away here, uh, Neuroscience and Pain Institute in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Uh, he also likes to uh, work um, in a holistic approach uh, for the polio population that he treats. And I will turn it over to, I think, to Dr. DeMeo first. Thank you. Uh, first of all, just housekeeping-wise, please feel free to, uh, there's some seats, a couple of seats up in the front and off to the side, so just so everybody can get in that wants to, uh, don't be shy. Uh, excuse me? Also, there are some uh, yellow sheets going around for questions. Fred and I love to answer questions. Um, however, with the, the breadth of this topic, uh, we're, we're going to have our, our hands full trying to kind of get through the material. Um, I uh, will probably be abbreviating uh, my comments to be sure that I don't, I'm not rude to Fred. So I'm actually going to set myself a timer at 20 minutes, and then I'll have five more minutes to wrap up. I can uh, finish, we, we'll have a question and answer session at the end, and if I have comments I don't get to, I'll try to get to them then. Uh, but please write down your questions and, and be focused about what they are um, for the end. Uh, my topic is, is going to be looking at uh, an overview of pain. So, so basically what we're doing here, we're not going to teach everybody everything about every type of pain that I ever wanted to know in 90 minutes, or in, in 75 minutes, <laughs> 75 what do we have? Minutes, yeah. so, so my role is going to be kind of giving you the 30,000 foot view um, and, in terms of how to look at pain as a, an overall issue. And then Fred's going to drive, dive down and kind of look at some specific examples of pain. So, and I do have, I'm going to be looking at my computer here just to kind of keep myself on task so that I don't, I don't wander. Uh, on the USB, there is a copy of, um, of my slides. You're not missing too much. In, in, there's a, one graphic at the end that, uh, um, that, that I'm going to try to act out a little bit if I get to that. Um, one of the things from my standpoint uh, as, a, as a, a physiatrist dealing with pain is to help people look at, um, at, at their pain from the standpoint of uh, of, of setting specific goals. And, and so we have a, 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 a program cr called Chronic Disease Self-Management that, that looks at all sorts of chronic disease, pain issues being one part of it. 
um, and, and helping individuals self-manage their pain. One of the problems with pain is your know, pain can lead to a sense of hopelessness, and hopelessness leads to a sense of dependence. And, and at that point, we're, we're kind of abdicating responsibility for our own pain. And so this philosophy uh, asks someone to really take responsibility and set specific goals as small as they might be initially. I also, um, as you heard, I try to treat holistically. So I try to, to uh, look at not only the physical aspects of pain, which obviously are, 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 are very important, but also looking at the emotional aspects and the spiritual dimension of pain as well. And, and, and I don't say that just in a kind of, um, kind of soft way. I, I'm talking about from a therapeutic way, from a, uh, from, from a perspective of helping someone uh, um, move beyond their pain issues. So there are physiatrists, for example, who deal only with pain from the physical standpoint. And so they'll use medications, they'll use injections, and, and if the issue is self-limited and acute, meaning a short term, th that oftentimes works fine. But we're talking about more our, our ongoing chronic issues where there is, is, is not maybe, there is always an emotional component. And I believe there's a spiritual component to that as well. Um, so, so I tend to really t try and look at those issues. Um, one, uh, from the 30,000-foot the, the view, one important distinction is to look at, at the type of pain that we're having because where the pain is coming from is going to be very important uh, uh, in, in terms of not only diagnostic uh, standpoint but also from the standpoint of, of therapy and how we approach it. So we can separate pain into, into muscle, tendon, and arthritic type pain. That tends to be a dull or aching pain. However, when it gets chronic, that can also have a burning component to it. Those types of pain often have an underlying inflammatory component. And so sometimes what you see is you might see pain with an activity, but that pain might just continue afterwards, or you might uh, develop soreness on a delayed effect. Uh, so, so that's the, the inflammatory component of that pain. And then you develop a cycle where, where, where that kind of feeds into biomechanical changes or, or you're moving differently and then you're causing more pain. And that's to, to, in distinction to a neuropathic type pain, which is typically uh, an electric type pain that, that can have a burning component as well. But that tends to be in a, in a specific distribution. So that, that is very important for, now you might not know what that distribution is, but it is important to describe very specifically where you're feeling that pain if it is in a specific area and your, and your physician hopefully or, or healthcare provider can recognize the distribution of that nerve and, and see that that, that that pain is a, a neuropathic pain as opposed to a, a chronic muscular pain. And, and as an example, again, I'm not going to be able to go through lots of details on specifics, but as an example, um, the, the approaches for pain management for neuropathic pain with medications are far different. There are medications that are fall into a, a, a class of seizure medications, for example, that are very helpful for nerve type pain, and, and you wouldn't use those for, for a muscle pain. Um, the, uh, the anatomy um, of, of the area in question is very important. And I, I, as, as an example, we decided that I would talk a little bit about sacroiliac pain. Sacroiliac pain is a, a very uh, common type of pain in uh, folks who have muscle weakness, who have um, asymmetry in their muscle strength and or their muscle flexibility, um, and folks who have gait deviations. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Okay. So that's why I thought it would be a good example. Now here's where it would be nice to have a PowerPoint and, and, uh, and, and have the anatomy, but, but I'll talk you through it here a little bit. And um, if I stand up and be loud, you wave to me if you can't hear me, okay? Um, our, our pelvis, as you've probably seen pictures with skeletons, the pelvis has a, um, looks, it looks like two big ears, right? Those big muscles and uh, bones on the side. And then in the back, there's a V-shaped bone, okay? That V-shaped bone, the base of the spine, is the sacrum. The iliac bones are those two wing bones. So the sacroiliac joints are those two joints right in the middle. That joint is not meant to move other than in childbirth. And in childbirth, the, uh, beforehand, the ligaments loosen up because of hormones, and that acts like a hinge to open up the birth canal. Other than that, not supposed to move, okay? The problem is that it is not fused, typically. Sometimes it can be, but, but typically it still remains to be a joint. The inside of this joint is like a Thomas's English muffin. It's, it's got nooks and crannies. It's not smooth like your hip or your shoulder because it's not meant to move. 
And what happens is, if you take that Thomas and English muffin and, you, and you, you, you pull it apart, if you rotate that just a little bit, it doesn't fit back together anymore. And that generates pain. Okay. The primary problem are the ligaments holding the, uh, the, the, the sacroiliac joint together. They get stretched and or torn. And when that happens, you get that motion and it can be very painful. So the issues in terms of, uh, of, of understanding what to do, it's very helpful if you know the anatomy, what you're dealing with. And that can motivate you to, for example, do the exercises that might undo the biomechanical factors that are causing the problem. So oftentimes the pain is in this area, can radiate down into the buttocks, can radiate down the leg, and, and that's very important because oftentimes back pain, leg pain, people assume it's a nerve impingement. And they say that that's a sciatic problem. Problem is that, uh, as I think we'll be talking about, that the, the sciatic nerve goes all the way down to your foot. So the pain doesn't go down to the foot, it goes into the thigh, and it's in the buttocks and thigh. The sacroiliac joint in this population is very important to consider. Now, in terms of factors that will make that sacroiliac joint uh, problematic, if you are asymmetric, you can see how if, if, if you have tightness on one side and not on the other side, that every step you take, you're gonna have a torquing of that sacroiliac joint. If you have weakness on one side and not on the other, there's an asymmetry. If you have to, if you have a foot drop and you try and lift your leg up in order to clear it, every step you're taking, you're putting a lot of stress on that sacroiliac joint. So again, I'm not, this is not meant to make you an expert on sacroiliac, this is meant to help you to think about the fact that your anatomy and understanding anatomy can then lead to a further understanding of what to do, what questions to ask, and from my standpoint, changes in behavior. Because changes in behavior, from my standpoint, are some of the most important things that, that, that uh, affect long-term outcomes from chronic pain. I choose to focus on, on what we can do, not focusing on the things that we can't do something about. So I'm always looking, what can we do? And so, so behavior in chronic pain, I think, is very, very important. Uh, Anti-inflammatories can be very important in sacroiliac problems as well, because it's, uh, Technically, you would call it a sacroiliitis. Anytime you hear the word itis, that's inflammation. Arthritis, bursitis, sacroiliitis, they're all inflammatory problems. So anti-inflammatories can be helpful. Injections can have a role in sacroiliac problems, but only in the context, from my standpoint, of um, in, in someone who is, who is doing a, a proper exercise program and they're trying to undo the factors that have caused the problem in the first place. Otherwise, basically what you can do is make the person feel better for a number of hours or days and they're right back where they were. But, but, but I don't dismiss those and I do those injections, I use those medications um, as, as kind of a, a, a kickstart to, to get things going. Um, I also, there's a, there's a term uh, that I like to use which is um, uh, micro re-injury. You know, we think about injury being a fall or you got hit by a car or something like that. However, every time, for sacroiliac problems, for example, um, when you sit for a long period of time, your, the, the muscles in the front of your, your, your hips get tight, okay? When you go to stand up, you have to extend your legs. Well, when those are tight, they pull your pelvis forward. But your back is pulling your spine this way. Well, your spine is attached to your sacrum. The hip muscles are attached to the, to, to the iliac bones. So there's this torquing effect when you try to stand up after you've been sitting too long, and that can result in pain. That's, the, and that's a classic example of, of micro-injury. And so the answer to that is don't sit for too long. Get up frequently, stretch those muscles before they get real tight, stop the injury, and, and the body has a tendency to heal by itself. And I want that, that's very important to hear. So, so we have to ask the question, why are we not healing? Not just how can we fix it, but how can we stop injuring it and, and then let the body take care of itself in terms of healing. Uh, I mentioned the therapeutic exercise. Uh, a lot of times people think about exercise as strengthening, but flexibility can be just as important, and I think the sacroiliac joint is a good example of that. Uh, improving biomechanics, um, we, we talked a little bit about that, um, but, but working with a, a good therapist or physician who can look not only at how we're walking, but how we pick things up. Are we, are we, are we bending down as much as possible? Uh, using the example of sacroiliac problems, if you bend forward at your, at your hips and you try and turn that flexion and rotation, uh, there's, there's, a, um, there's a woman I had once who was in her late 80s 
And, and she, when I told her, uh, talked to her about sacred like problems, she said, oh, I, I know what, what that is. She, she, says, she said, there was a song we sang as a little girl, and she started singing the song. I've got a click clack in my sacred iliac. <laughs> and, and that's where you would get it, bending forward and rotating, and go click, clack, and go back in place. And so you want to avoid those, those movements that are going to cause that type of injury. Uh, modalities, uh, ice can be very helpful for sacred iliac problems. People think about heat, heat is, is soothing, but ice can be very helpful at reducing inflammation and also reducing muscle spasm, and oftentimes the muscle spasm that's holding the joint out of place. So I say try a cold pack. If it helps, use it all the time. There's no downside. It's not going to hurt you. There's no cost to it other than two seconds to go past the freezer. So don't sit around with icing, but, but certainly putting ice on, uh, on the affected area when you're watching TV or reading or something like that. Um, other biomechanical issues I talk about uh, uh, are sleeping positions, use of a body pillow. If we're laying on our sides, our hips, especially with women, are much wider than our knees. And, and so what happens is that there's an inherent rotation in the pelvis just sleeping on our side. So sleeping with a, a pillow between the knees can undo that, but if it's only between the knees, then there's a rotation because your ankle is lower than your knee, so that rotation still goes up the spine. So a body pillow, for those who don't know, would be a, a five foot long pillow that's, that's um, uh, cylindrical. I tell people find something cheap. You don't want to have a nice down pillow that is really soft because then it's useless. It just compresses. We want something really firm. And basically you lay on your side, you put your arm over it, you put your knee over it, and your thigh over it, and you kind of lay into it. So you're what we call semi-prone. You're a little bit on your stomach, but, but mostly on your side. And, and so it's take the, the arm and the leg and part of your, your, your torso is being supported. So you have less weight on the bed. You can stay in one position longer. But most importantly, your spine is in a nice straight position. It's not being torqued like that. Very helpful for sick. Really act problems, hip problems, shoulder problems. Uh, it, it, lying on your side can be, yeah, yeah. Although you can also put the head of the bed up and be somewhat on your, on your, your side as well. No, it's okay. Um, uh, bracing is another issue we look at for the reasons I, I mentioned. If someone has a, a, a drop foot, uh, that can be very important. It also, and this is a little bit harder to convey uh, um, in, in a brief time in a group, but, but having the foot on the ground in a stable position can, can help um, with, with weakness more proximally. In other words, if I uh, have weakness in my ankle and, and, and that, brace, that ankle is then braced, having that foot on the ground and being stable, I need less strength up here to stabilize. It's as if someone without a neurologic problem is walking on the sand. They're going to get weaker. They get more tired because it takes a lot more strength to stabilize you. Every time you move, there's, there's movement. Or walking on a ship, for example. If there's movement underneath you, you have to correct up here. But if somebody has weakness and, and that's braced, it, it provides more stability, uh, more stability, uh, less fatigue, less fatigue, less micro-injury. Uh, medications. I mentioned anti-inflammatories. Uh, words on a couple of other things. Um, there are non steroidal anti inflammatories, and dozens of them, uh, as well as your over counter Aleve and Advil. A um, couple of things with that. Uh, oftentimes, to get the full anti inflammatory effect, it, it, the medication should be taken regularly. And, and, and there's direct to consumer advertising with these medications where people look at them as painkillers. And that's unfortunate because the, you, lose, you don't get the anti inflammatory effect. So, for example, Aleve should be taken. Uh, two tablets twice a day, and I say take it for ten, seven to ten days to get a full anti-inflammatory dose. Think about it as an antibiotic rather than as a painkiller. And if it doesn't help, then you stop it. Uh, but sometimes what happens is it can help, and you're good to go for a while, and then you might overdo it a month later, and then go back on it for seven to ten days. And so that way you minimize your risk by stopping it, but you maximize your benefit. Everything I think should be risk benefit with medications or procedures or anything like that. And what a lot of people do is they say, well, I won't take it very often, I'll take it every other day, or, or I'll take one a day. And so what they think they're doing is lowering their risk. In fact, what they're doing is they're lowering their benefit, but they still have some risk. 
Another anti-inflammatory would be oral steroids, um, and there's certainly a role for those. They can be very helpful at kind of resetting the clock if somebody has had an injury uh, or when they're starting therapy. Uh, they cannot be used long term, but they certainly are, for, the, for certain people, appropriate short term. Uh, they're to be avoided when, you know, with somebody who has brittle diabetes, for example, or, or some other medical problems. Muscle relaxants have a role. Most of them have problems with, with sedation. However, many people tolerate them fine. So my, I, I don't hesitate really to use them in certain individuals, but I tell them, look, this might make you tired. And so let's take the first dose before you go to bed. You wait up a couple hours, and if it makes you tired, do not take it during the day. So you know, if, if there's a medication that 50% of the people are gonna have sedation, well, how do we know which, you're in the 50% that does or doesn't? Uh, I have people who are truck drivers taking muscle relaxants, and they do fine, but, but only if they've shown that they're not going to have a problem by taking it at nighttime or the weekend, then they could take it at work. So I don't hear bad stories about somebody like, oh, that medication knocked me out. Well, I won't doubt that, but that doesn't mean it's going to knock you out. And if it helps you to get over the hump so then you don't need it and, and you can have this, the, 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 uh, the pain issue heal, then, then I think that's worth it. Uh, narcotic medications. Well, I have a very biased view about narcotic medications. I need to, to let you know that. I just don't use them. I, I basically forget my DEA number. I, I, I just don't use them. That's not to say they're evil. It's not to say that they're wrong for everybody. There are some people who can be on chronic narcotics and do well. I just think that's not common. Usually, um, you can get into problems with long-term use. So just be very careful. And it's a big national problem. Um, did my, okay, seven more minutes. Um, complementary versus alternative medicine. I really like the term complementary medicine. I really don't like the term alternative medicine. Alternative medicine basically means you're looking for an alternative. You're looking for something different. And, and I, I, t t I've seen so many times that people have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And so they get frustrated with the physician or healthcare provider, and, and, and they just throw that out and, and look at something completely different. And I would rather look at the different and see how, how can we get the best of both. Because I, 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 I do, as a physician, I look at things in an analytic standpoint. I want to prove that they're working. I, I want to see cause effect. And then if you take the medication or the, the therapy away, does the, the problem come back? And then when you reintroduce it, does it come? I, I, I think that way. And I think otherwise, we, if, we, if, we, if we throw the baby out with the bathwater, we can go off on a tangent and miss some things that really could have helped. Um, and, and so uh, we never want to act out of frustration. We never want to act out of desperation. Um, and so I would not dismiss anything. But, but let's see, how can we how can you use that? And also being careful, um, sometimes those approaches are not quite as benign as, um, as we think. Um, and, uh, and we can have debates about this. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't need to be an either or. Uh, one of our nurses uh, uses essential oils and aromatherapy, and, and good stuff. But we'll have a little debate on this, and she'll say, you know, she's taught that such and such will cleanse your liver, but it has no side effects. I'm like, come on. I mean, let's be real here. I mean, let's think logically. You know, if something is going to have an effect biochemically on your liver, then there are potential side effects. There's just no way it doesn't. We might know no way they are. Maybe they're happening over such a long period of time we don't see them. But let's not put our head in the sand and say they don't happen. It's just that it's not FDA control, so they don't have the studies. They don't know what they are. So just be careful. Um, but, 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 don't, but don't dismiss them either. There's some really good stuff out there that can be helpful. And, um, and, and, and again, my, su my suggestion is that you find a good physician or healthcare provider that you can discuss those we with and weave them into more conventional approaches. Hurt versus harm. This is a key one. <coughs> um, and and this, is, uh, this is meant to help us think in a way that will prevent uh, micro reinjury. Um, there, has anybody heard the term "no pain, no gain"? Okay. Yeah. Do we do we believe that? No. Yeah. I do. <laughs> okay. I do. I, if you go to a gym and it says "no pain, no gain," I, I think that's true. I mean, think about it. Have you ever had something in life where you had a major benefit that you didn't have to work for, that you didn't have to put some sweat equity in, you know, blood, sweat, and tears? Right. Uh, if 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 we're weightlifting, you know, it's going to hurt. If we're stretching our hamstrings 
and we expect to get benefit, but, but we're going to stop before it hurts, you're not getting anywhere. I would maintain that there's nothing wrong with hurt. The problem is harm. Okay? And so what we need to decide is, is this pain good pain or is it bad pain? And, and embrace the good pain. Say, you know, that's the evidence I'm getting better. But here's the key. So let's first take, for example, somebody who's stretching their hamstrings. If I'm stretching my hamstrings and it's really getting, you know, and I'm pushing and pushing through it, and then I stop and I get up and I walk around, I'm like, I feel good, right? I didn't harm myself. Now, if I'm stretching my hamstrings and I'm being dumb about it and I push really hard, really sudden, and I don't gradually, and, and there's a pop, and I get up and I can't walk, and I'm hobbling around and I've got pain for hours or days afterwards, I tore part of the muscle. I harmed myself. Okay? And, and unfortunately, people swing from, from being inactive to being overactive. And that's the graphic I wanted to get to, and I probably should be wrapping up here. Um, but uh, I can share it later, uh, or, uh, or you can check it out on the PDF. But basically, the, the, the point is, is that, that, that our personalities and how we approach pain issues has a major effect on what we do. Uh, there are key words that, that I try to hone into when I'm talking to folks. Uh, one is the word can't, right? And as soon as I hear some, a patient say can't, I do this, and we talk about it. Because when, when somebody says they can't do something, I can't help them. I'd rather have them say, I don't know how to, I have a hard time doing this, and such. And, and, and the point is, if it's just me and the patient in the room, there's two people listening to them say that. They're listening to it as well. This population generally doesn't have a problem with that word. Okay? This, this is a population generally that, that, that doesn't know the word can't and pushes through things. There's other words, however, that I think are very appropriate to be concerned about in this group. Have to, need to, and should. Okay? I see some nods. Right? I would maintain that would be helpful to strike those from your vocabulary completely. And I don't think that there's a single example that you can give me where you can't substitute the words want to. You, 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 you have to get the house clean because you're having company. No, you want to do that. Do you have to pay your taxes? Yes. No. <laughs> you, you want to avoid the risk of going to jail. <laughs> the only thing you have to do is die. Everything else is a want. Now, here's the point. The tax example is a good one. I mean, you could say, well, what's the difference? I mean, obviously, I don't want to, to go to jail. But when you put it in those terms, it's empowering. When you say have to, need to, or should, you back yourself in a corner, you have no options. When you say want to, then you can say, it's got a cost to me. All right, am I willing to pay that cost? You know what, I'm really not willing to pay that cost. But you start thinking, what are some other alternatives? Well, you know what, maybe I can do this, but I can break it up into parts. Or maybe I can ask for some help, even though I don't like asking for help, I really want this. You can think of other ways to do it. When you say have to, need to, or should, you're stuck. Okay? So, um, so I have uh, this graphic, and, in, and, and it outlines that we all have a certain capacity for any specific uh, function. How far we can walk, what we can do. And, um, and, and with, um, on, 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 on the spectrum of activity, there'll be over here a couch potato who does nothing but eat, sleep, and poop, okay? And over here is an ultra marathoner who can run 120 miles without stopping. And, and he didn't get there by accident, and he didn't get there by accident. They both worked at it. They just, this one didn't realize what he was doing maybe. But, but each of us has a capacity somewhere in the middle. And so let's say it's here. And, and this is, I'm going to be generalizing here, uh, and, but, but, but we've got to wrap up. So, so folks with post-polio have a tendency to cross the line so much that then they have to rest. And if you have to rest, now you're over here. And then you overdo it again. Okay? The problem is overactivity and overrest both make your capacity drift down this way. This guy over here got there by working just below his capacity and being patient. And he pushed the capacity down the line. 
So the point is, I don't want you overdoing it. I don't want you underdoing it. I don't want you going back and forth. I'd like you right below what your capacity is. And in order to know where that is, you have to be smart about it. You cross the line a little bit. You watch the reaction. And if you did well, you just keep moving on. Apologize for going over a couple minutes. OK. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Uh, remember, if anybody has any questions uh, that you want to have picked up, um, we'll get somebody to, yep. It, it, well, we'll have to find somebody. Yeah. 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 Hang on to them for a minute, but yeah. uh, oh, I can pick them up. Or can okay. you want to pick them up? Okay, great. Thank you very much, Bill DeMeo. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, you didn't use the word pain generator. I thought you were actually going to, but because uh, I put it uh, in the slides. But the, the only reason I mentioned that was uh, we had thought that after this uh, uh, lovely overview talk of uh, philosophy, which I completely agree with. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Um, that I would rev review some of the more common pain syndromes that post polio patients face, okay? Because from a, I guess it's not just a physician standpoint, it's also your standpoint as a person with the problem, okay, is to take ownership of it and, and be responsible for it. You have to understand what is it. And it can be sort of not just clearly one thing. So identifying where, where is the pain coming from anatomically, what part of the body, is it a moving part, is it a static part, when do you have it, all of those things are extremely important. Uh, because, and that will guide us as professionals and you to the treatment options that can be effective. So having said that, um, if I'm going to cover very many in a 20 minutes, um, I won't be able to say everything I want to, and I'll talk fast, as I'm, some of you know I can do. So I hope you can follow me. OK, one of the first things is, where is it? Where is the pain? And I was going to approach it more on a regional basis, OK? Be so like, for, I'm going to start with shoulder pain, OK? People come in and they say, my shoulder is really hurting me. Well. The first thing I, as a physician, have to figure out if I'm going to be able to help you is what part of the shoulder. And I start with shoulder, too, because it's, it is one of the more complex areas of the body in terms of the, t the different muscles, the joint, the shoulder joint itself that we call the glenohumeral joint, but there's also the acromioclavicular joint. There's actually a scap another uh, sternal clavicular joint. There's a lot of different parts of anatomy, and there's multiple muscles that are involved in the shoulder joint. So we have to figure out what is the pain generator that is producing your shoulder uh, pain. And you need to be a partner with us in terms of helping us try to figure that out, OK? Because you're the ones that's having the problem. OK, the first one that we cover and we hear a lot about uh, is rotator cuff problems, OK? Or rotator cuff, I, I prefer calling them usually rotator cuff tendonitis. Please try not to call it rotor, rotor cuff, OK? It's, it comes from the word rotators, OK? Because they're, they're the muscles that will participate in um, turning the shoulder sideways or the arm sideways. Uh, and rotator cuff problems, uh, most of them are actually due to inflammation, okay, uh, of the tendons uh, in those rotator cuff muscles. Uh, you can tear them, and you can tear them in a fall, okay, and that would be a traumatic tear of the rotator cuff, uh, one of the part or all of the rotator cuff. But more commonly, particularly in an aging, disabled group of people who tend to have been chronically overusing their, their uh, shoulders and their arms, it's a degenerative tear of the, of the rotator cuff muscles. That is, it's frayed. Uh, most of the time, uh, uh, if there is not a fall or some type of a sudden large force, uh, it's a partial tear, okay? It's a partial tear in a degenerative tendonitis. <clears throat> and it is best treated in most instances uh, as other inflammatory problems, as Bill mentioned. <clears throat> and it does, it, and it's tricky because it requires this combination of rest or, and anti-inflammatories, ice, other methods to sh cut down the inflammation and the pain. But the ultimate 
solution has got to be to strengthen the shoulder or figure out how you're going to completely use the shoulder differently uh, or do things differently with the arm and shoulder or some combination of those things, you see. And so that usually, in my experience, involves referrals to physical therapists who really understand that uh, and know what they're doing. What is the rotator cuff? Just a brief word on that. It's primarily three muscles, okay? The supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and, rota and teres minor. There are three muscles that come up from the scapular muscle, okay, the wing bone, and they come around the front of the shoulder rotator joint, the glenohumeral joint, and stabilize and keep that head of the humerus, what we call the ball. It's a ball and socket joint, but the socket is quite shallow. And to keep that ball in there, you need muscle force that's holding it there. Otherwise, it'll fall out of place, so to speak. And of course, as you may know, shoulder dislocations are not uncommon. And so that muscle takes a lot of wear and tear. Uh, it's primary activity is involved with rotation, and so the symptom that you're looking for is when rotating, you know, reaching to put your arm in your coat, okay, is a common one, okay, but sometimes it's rotating it the other way. Those are typical, but although not exclusively uh, seen when it is a rotator cuff type of problem. Also can be when you're pushing, you know, when you're depressing the shoulder downward a lot. Now, rotator cuff problems also occur in combination with other problems in the shoulder, okay? Commonly, bursitis problems. And you end up with bursitis in the front of the shoulder, and we tend to call that uh, an, an acromial, uh, um, a subacromial bursitis. And it also relates close to the, what you hear people refer to as impingement syndromes. And impingement syndromes in the shoulder mean a pinching between the muscles and tendons in different parts of that, they're getting caught uh, between that and the bone. And it can be either the acromial bone, like the, which is the tip of the collarbone as it uh, articulates with the scapular or wing bone, um, or it can be pinched in between the, the glenohumeral joint. So typically those things are when we're reaching upward, okay, uh, or, or strongly across. And if you get inflammation in one of the bursas or the tendons, then you're more likely to get the impingement, okay, because it's decreasing the space. So they, that's, I say this not to overwhelm anybody, uh, but it, 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 it's a reflection of how complex the anatomy really is, uh, and it's tricky for physicians and therapists and other healthcare professionals to zero in on exactly what is the primary pain generator, because often there's one that started the problem, but by the time it's seen, there's a lot of inflammation in other areas around it, and it takes a while to both identify those and come up with the best ways that they're going to respond. Again, the combination of the things that are, you're going to try to use will be what Dr. DeMeo uh, uh, had referred to. The other thing I would say is that most of these tendonitis and ultimately what leads to in bursitis is around the shoulder that lead to impingement and other issues uh, are, can be referred to as inflammatory strain syndromes is one I, used to, uh, I like to use. And if you think about it, with you have weak muscles, okay, or, too, or they're weakening and they're not as weak as you thought they were or they used to be then it's very easy to apply more force to them than they're capable of giving, and then they partially pull apart, okay? And that's what we call a strain. That's what you, if it's totally tearing, that, that becomes, what, a, is that a sprain then? <laughs> Sometimes partial people, tear. partial, or it goes into a partial tear. And so there's various degrees of that, but mo all of them are followed by inflammation and pain. Okay, that's why we, uh, I like to refer to them as inflammatory, inflammatory strain syndromes. And again, combinations of the medications and the icing and then moving gradually into therapy and then looking at what are the movements that are causing it, what should you avoid, what should you do, uh, what do you need to do differently, uh, what can you do to strengthen the shoulders is the real long-term answer. 
Now there's a whole bunch of others that sometimes are a little more specific, uh, and I didn't mention the steroid injections, but again, steroid injections are used a lot in shoulder joints by a variety of doctors, and I, I use them, and I think they're an excellent way to do a short-term um, cooling down on a severe inflammatory problem. But you don't want to do them repeatedly because you are putting in medication that ultimately, at least for a while, makes the tissues weaker than they were before, weaker in the sense of withstanding force. <clears throat> and so you don't, they're more ultimately perhaps more easy to deter in the future. So you want to really use them when you're really in misery, okay, and you can hardly move the shoulder. Uh, then steroid injections uh, uh, play a real role, but they've got to be followed in most instances by some kind of therapy. Sometimes not too long if it really takes care of the problem, but more frequently it settles it down so at least you can tolerate now beginning to get back into the movement phase and analyzing the movement and figuring out what to do. There is one tendon in the front that's part of the uh, biceps muscle, we call it the long head of the biceps, uh, and that's sometimes referred to as a bicipital tendonitis, and, that can, and it's in the front of the shoulder, and that can be a very localized kind of severe pain, and those really do respond very well to an injection uh, in the sheath around them and settles that down, and then you can again look to see if you can find out what caused it and how to prevent it from recurring. Another one is pain right at the insertion of the deltoid. The deltoid is your shoulder muscle, and about a third to half a way down the arm, there's a little bursa under it as it attaches into the arm bone, and that can get, again, strained, inflamed, stirred up, and those, again, res can respond very well to steroid injections, icing, in medications, and then ultimately they've got to be strengthened. And sometimes it's one of those long-term strengthening. And if you don't have much strength in that muscle because of your polio, uh, then it becomes more problematic as to how you're going to get back into avoiding it in the future. Again, then you usually have to get more into how do I do things differently? <laughs> how do you know I don't transfer it in the same way, or I've got to you know walk in a different way and not use the crutches. You can get arthritis in the shoulder joint itself. It's relatively uncommon and usually not the primary source of pain, but it does occur. And if it is, then you tend to need more of some kind of long-term medication. People do consider shoulder joint replacements, as some of you may know. They tend to not be a good thing to do if you don't have strong muscles around the shoulders because they still don't make the shoulders stable. So I haven't found them a particularly helpful issue for people with long-term uh, polio. <clears throat> Whereas arthritis, if it is more common in the, in the acromioclavicular joint, those can be treated in a number of ways by therapists and injections, and then they cut down. If you can settle that inflammation down in that joint, then you have less of the impingement and the other pain with movement problems. If your shoulder freezes up and you can hardly move it at all, it's just totally stiff and painful, then we call that frozen shoulders. Usually there's an element of capsulitis in that, often precipitated in the before by one of these other inflammatory problems. Those, again, you almost then need to have a steroid injection. Uh, occasionally, even under anesthesia, somebody has to move it around, and then a long-term course of therapy. And that's what you want to avoid before it gets to that point. Okay, and then other problems, when people come in saying their shoulder, they're really talking about pain more down, it doesn't radiate down into the arm, because if it radiates down into the arm, and then we get worried about, is it coming from the neck? And a lot of times, neck problems do cause pain through the shoulder. <clears throat> a lot of pain from uh, inflammatory problems in the neck joints or the neck discs, uh, and nerve structures or the ligaments in the neck, go down to the neck muscles, but they're the scapular muscles, the ones that go between the wing bone and up in the, in the head and the neck. And it feels like shoulder, because when you're moving your shoulder, those muscles are also getting moved around and stretched. So a lot of times, their trigger points in those muscles can be the first sign of some of the neck problems. And again, that's part of what the doctor has to do, because can he precipitate the neck, uh, the, the pain, even if it's pain down around the shoulder, with the extremes of the neck movement, either rotation or up and down. A lot of times it's up and to the side that really <clears throat> c 
clearly bring on the pain, even though you get it with other types of things. If you get a pain from the neck that is actually pinching off a nerve root, then you may get what we call radicular pain or nerve type of pain down the whole arm. That is usually more the sharp shooting pain. It will usually reach into the forearm hand and fingers uh, and is more localized. And for those type of problems, again, then you need to be referred to somebody who's going to treat your neck, okay? Uh, and many times we see neck and shoulder problems, and it's hard to tell which was the first of the two. Uh, and it's, uh, you start treating them both, or the one you think is the worst, and then it leads to the, to the second, okay? Um, in my experience, one of the best treatments for neck-related problems is referral to physical therapists. Uh, occasionally, you know, when problems are early and people are young, chiropractors can do a lot of good, but you've got to be extremely careful with manipulation to the neck when we're older uh, because it can really cause some serious problems, and we have all are familiar with that. Some types of gentle mobilization that therapists and others can do can be helpful, but in my experience, things like traction are what is most helpful, okay, to try to open up those facet joints, uh, loosen and stretch out some of the ligaments and supporting structures, and then follow that ultimately with postural exercises and attempts at strengthening. <clears throat> and it's a tricky issue, again, and it takes the right combination of therapist of, of, uh, and uh, professional, usually physical therapists, working together. Uh, and it's where the communication needs to be so important about, is it helping? Is it how, how much it did help did it give? Was it a short-term help? And then it was later worse. What all can you do? Uh, X-rays, of course, would need to be verifying some of the uh, actual source of the problem. If you have numbness in the hand or the arm, then we're much more concerned in, uh, about actual nerve pain and then tests like EMGs are often helpful uh, to uh, be certain of that. But other types of arm problems associated with numbness are also common in polio survivors, and they include what we call nerve entrapment problems, the most common one being, of course, carpal tunnel syndrome, down in the wrist where your hand and fingers are numb, particularly at night. And those problems are, again, if anybody is using their hands all the time for crutches, for weight bearing, for pushing manual wheelchairs, uh, those are all the exact activities that tend to narrow and cause inflammation of the tendons and the arthritis in the wrist joint that narrow the space where the median nerve has to go through the carpal tunnel and gives us those symptoms. So, identifying that early, being on the alert for it, talking to a professional about that to get into early, early semi-preventive treatment from it getting worse uh, is important. Things like using splints, okay, uh, at night so that you keep your wrist out of the curled position will give you much more tolerance during the day. Sometimes if there's an inflammatory problem because you've overused the tendons of your arms, and so you've got a lot of pain in the forearm along the, with the wrist and the hand, along with the numbness, then particularly steroid injections sometimes into the carpal tunnel are a great idea. They calm down all that inflammation, then you use the splint for a short while, and then you can tolerate again, and the nerve's got enough room, it isn't numb and tingly all the time. If it gets to be numb and tingly all the time, then you probably do need surgery. And surgery on a polio survivor's hand is not more difficult necessarily from the surgeon, and it's probably going to heal and take care of the problem. The difficulty is you living and taking care of yourself for two or three weeks after a surgery is done because you can't use your hand if it's got to heal uh, from the surgical release or opening up of the space where the, carpal the nerve is for the, in the carpal tunnel. But that's where you want to engage your, your rehabilitation professional so you can plan out how you get extra help, what, how you do things differently, how are you going to survive. You've got to involve your spouse or your uh, caregivers and family. I mean, all of those things uh, are going to play into it, but you've got to face the fact that you probably need to get it done. <laughs> okay? And there's no reason you should ultimately avoid it. It's just you've got to do a lot more planning for it. Okay. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about fibromyalgia, but fibromyalgia is a diffuse pain syndrome. Again, it's most typically through the upper back, arms and shoulders and neck, 
Uh, and it is so common among polio survivors that it often gets uh, mixed up with and uh, imitates in, uh, in post-polio syndrome. There's a couple papers in the literature that describe that quite uh, well. Uh, I think the important thing here to remember is uh, if you're a polio survivor, probably it's really part of your post-polio syndrome issues, but it's related to weak muscles that you're overusing, okay, and postural abnormalities. And you're, you're just one of those people that uh, the muscles tend to get knotted up, okay, with these painful little trigger areas. There's a lot of uh, successful treatments for those. They're hands-on treatment from massages and trigger point releases by therapists of various sorts, including physical therapists. Injection therapy with just Novocaine in those areas can be very helpful. Sleep is extremely important. Uh, if you have that problem, be sure to go to Dr. DeMeo's talk on sleep uh, uh, in the next few days. Uh, <clears throat> and you've got to look at the emotional problem and how you're using your arm and your overall activity level. That's about all I have probably time for to refer to on that very large topic. Another is elbow pain problems. Well, the most common problem if your pain is in the elbow area is probably a uh, uh, antithitis or tennis elbow related problem. Well, what is tennis elbow? Not many of you are playing tennis, I doubt. Uh, <laughs> We still call it that, but uh, it's really a lateral epicondylitis, and then what that means is it's the attachment of your wrist muscles, okay, your wrist and hand muscles, finger muscles, into the wrist on the outside of, not the wrist, into the uh, uh, distal arm, just at the elbow, okay. It's what anchors those muscles, okay, so that you can have strength to your grip uh, and holding on to things. Uh, and they're very easily strained, okay, uh, either from a sudden jerky pulley movement or from too much loading and force. And they get very inflamed, and it's a very painful area, okay, when it's inflamed at that attachment into the bone. So it can hurt like the heck, but it's not ultimately a serious or disabling condition. And it will, the natural history of it is good if you can take care of it right. Ultimately, it requires calming down the inflammation, whether that be with icing or medication. Tight bands are useful because they hold down and keep that attachment a little stronger because ultimately you have to re-strengthen that muscle tendon attachment to the bone for that inflammation to go away. And even in completely healthy people who aren't using their hands routinely um, in a, a stressful way, that can take months, okay, for that to go away completely and reheal. It shouldn't take that long for it to be not miserable, okay, but you'll still feel, feel something there for a long time. And if it's, if it's uh, affecting your function, your everyday function or your job, then you need to involve hand therapists of some sort, okay, to really get at the specifics of how you're going to strengthen. <clears throat> Okay, saving a few minutes, I'm not going to talk a lot about arthritis in the wrist and the fingers, but they do, they're also very common. The most common joint in the entire body for, for older people as we age, independent of polio, is the joint at the base of our thumb. We call that the, carpal, the first metacarpal metacarpal joint. Uh, and um, the arthritis of that joint is really, is, it's an aggravating pain. It can ache at night it, when you use your hand. <clears throat> I don't know there's a good solution to that, but there is, again, solutions that do help, okay? They don't necessarily get rid of the problem entirely. People who have weakness in their hand muscles, which a lot of polio survivors did, that little atrophy of that ever since you were young and had your polio, uh, predisposes you to bad arthritis at that joint. <clears throat> and if it gets too painful, then you don't want to use your hand and your finger and your pinch and your grip. There's the th some of the things that you can do include medications and injections. I found more commonly the one that helps people continue to do activities without being disabled by the pain are work with hand therapists on splints of some sort that can partially immobilize that, okay? Not splints that you have to wear full time, but you put on when you're gonna do something that requires strong or repetitive pinching and movements with your finger. I had a famous polio patient one time who was a painter and she couldn't paint anymore because it was so painful for her to hold that brush. 
And, but when we got her, we settled it down to bed with an injection, uh, uh, but then we gave her that splint, and then she put that splint on when she was gonna paint, okay, which it generally was like half hour, hours, a couple hours at a time she'd wanna paint. And then she got by it, but she didn't have to wear it all the time when she was eating or other sorts of light activities. <clears throat> uh, occasionally a hand, a really good hand therapist can give you some, there are some surgical alternatives that be, can be good, but as with any type of surgery, uh, you're gonna go into that as probably a last resort, and I don't have time to talk about that in detail. How much time do we have? Well, um, let have me just five end, minutes. Uh, five minutes, a uh, couple of issues on leg pain, okay? Again, the issue with your leg pain, if it's not what Dr. DeMeo was talking about, and it's not a radiating pain coming in from your back, and I'm not gonna say a lot about spinal pain problems because there is a whole couple of lectures, Dr. Vandenacre and a couple of others that are gonna come up on spine pain problems. <clears throat> but there are a lot of pains in the hip area that can come from hip arthritis, where you have limitations with range of motion, okay, and pain clearly precipitated by that, may or, and usually with weight bearing makes it worse, but it should occur at extremes of motion even if you're not putting weight on it. But there's also subluxations and muscle strains and bursitis and then tight muscles around the uh, hip, including the uh, uh, hip rotator muscles, okay. Uh, they give you piriformis syndrome type of issues. There's a lot of inflammatory musculoskeletal strain issues that can affect the hip area. Um, so those have to be looked at. Bursitis at the outside lateral part of the hip is again another one that's extremely common. Those do respond very well to an injection. But again, usually the hard part is to f look at what was causing the likelihood of inflammation in the area, that area, and usually it's from the inflammatory uh, limping related to weakness and asymmetry uh, uh, in your hips. Then there's a the whole issue of knee pain, you know, and the, how many different kinds of knee pain are we, and what's the pain generator around the knee? Is it in the joint? Is it in the ligaments? Is it in some of the tendons around the joint? Is it going backward from a back knee problem? Um, lots and lots of issues. Their bracing has a lot more that can be helpful, okay? And again, lots of times it has to be worked on in combination with a physical therapist. We have had polio survivors with hip and knee replacements, okay, that can be done. But again, they're fraught with problems and it's extremely important if you're at the point of having to consider that that you get non-surgical opinions first by a couple of other physicians, okay, about make sure you know your other options, and probably by more than one physician, hopefully someone who's done it on people who've had weak hips and knees. The more the hip and the knee are weak, the more the problem is likely uh, if you're considering replacements, because the replacements still don't stabilize the joints entirely, and the weak and unstable joint is what got you into the problem in the first place. I have a lot more will and willingness to consider, my patients to consider a joint replacements and consider the surgeon's opinion if he recognizes they are going to need to continue to use a cane and crutch and usually a brace after the surgery is done because the primary reason for the replacement is to get rid of the severe chronic pain that's there in the joint all the time, but not to make them walk better or without a device, okay? Uh, if everybody, or at least not likely, and again, highly variable depending on the degree of weakness in the individual patient, but that's my primary concern, because they don't, if they don't understand that as a surgeon, then I'm worried that they don't really understand the whole problem. Foot pain, ankle pain, again, tendonitis, lots of arthritis, old surgeries that were stabilizing the ankle when you were young, that worked very well. They often don't last a lifetime. They last 25, 35 years. Then they start getting weak and move and wiggle and all kinds of issues that require you to go back to bracing. Um, but sometimes there's inflammatory tendon, tendon problems or ligament problems that can be worked out with combinations of anti-inflammatories, injections, therapy, other things that therapists can do. Those are your general approaches that you're gonna to have to use for the complex and large number of individualized ankle foot pain problems. I'm gonna end at that point because we wanna save time for questions. And uh, we'll start with the questions, but if there are any others out there, uh, 
Oh, good. That lady I'd is say, going did, around. Do we have anybody who's walking around and can pick them up? Yes, yeah. that lady. And Appreciate it if there is somebody. First, a comment, Fred. I always, I always love to hear you talk, and I can tell the audience did too. And I, I'll bet you, if I review a videotape just looking at people's faces, I could make diagnoses. You, you <laughs> talk about a problem, and they, they smile, the faces or light their, up. their eyebrow would go up, or they'd nod, or oh yeah, that's me. And <laughs> so I, I'm sure you appreciate it. And by the way, also, obviously, we there's no way we're going to get through all these questions. No, I'm no. betting there's some really good ones there. And we'll, we'll talk about it. Maybe we can figure out something to do with the questions, out, whether it be email or well, somehow answer some of the questions outside. Uh, it's excellent questions from people. Uh, a lot of them, as I was trying to put together, are, are similar. And many of them, I'm, they were sort of answered by you, you know, from oh. questions that people thought of. So okay. I've... If She'll you do don't, some sorting. You, if you, you make oh, those I have been. Yeah. If you don't hear your question, it's not because it wasn't a good one. I'm just trying to put as many together as possible. And do uh, we have right after this? There's there, is there a break? Uh, it's, it's lunch. The lunch break. Yep. It's the lunch break. So, so so we should excuse people, and then if some people want to stay and ask questions. If they didn't get their right. que specific question answered, if you're willing to, I sure. imagine they would appreciate well, I would it. Be. I would be. Okay. The longer you are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is one. Um, I I. Either of you can uh, feel free to answer, but um, two of them had sort of asked about the TENS units or other kinds of electronic stimulation. Um, what's your opinion for uh, treatment for those that have had polio? I, I, if you have another answer, mine, mine would be, uh, uh, I mean, TENS is very well accepted. There's no harm to it. Um, and, and I would use that um, along the lines of, of my, the comments I made with complementary medicine uh, to add that to what you're doing, uh, and if that's helpful, then great. Uh, I don't see a problem with that. Um, I always want to think about, though, what's the underlying problem, and so that's, uh, it's not going to do you any harm. I don't have a problem with trying it at all, and if it's, specifically, if it's helping your function. If you put TENS on and you, I'm sorry? I'm sorry. If, um, if, if it's helping improve your function, if you're able to do more with the TENS, then absolutely. I just add that, yeah, remember, it is blocking your perception of the pain. And so if you're up against a problem and everybody knows what, maybe they know what the problem is, then, but there ain't any good treatments, okay, and you're still left with the pain, and that takes care of it, then use it, absolutely, and because there is no harm to it, okay. But know whatever is causing that is still going on. You see, it's not getting at the cause at all. Oh, good question. A transcutaneous nerve stimulator. And they're usually little electrodes that you put on kind of in the area around the pain. And then it goes to a battery with some little wires that you put in your pocket or something and uh, it blocks the pain perception. That's a whole more complex question. Yeah, those are surgical procedures. Yeah, and I think, again, that is for chronic intractable pain, clearly, that nothing else has worked for. And again, it does not change the problem. So it's only a matter of it's more effective, ultimately, for a severe chronic pain that nothing, nobody else can do anything else about, and it may be something then you have to consider. I don't find it terribly useful in many polio survivors, but there's been a few, I mean, you know, because they're up against something nobody can otherwise fix, and they're left with a pain that there's no good answer for, and then that may need to be considered. Okay. No, I, I would agree, and, and not to belabor the other questions, but uh, again, I would have a functional approach to that, and, and when they do a, a, a trial, uh, I, I would say, does it help me do more? To, to knock yeah. your pain down 10 or 15 percent, um, I'm not sure that that's worth, everything is risk benefit to me, mm -hmm. and, and there is risk there, it's something implantable, uh, and, and there are downsides to it, and that's okay. You know, if somebody hypothetically is able to, you know, to walk three times as far in a day, or they're able to work and they can't work otherwise, then you'd be willing to accept a fair amount of risk, okay? But if it's maybe a 10% change in pain with no functional implications, then I wouldn't say the risk is, is worth that. That's how I would think about it. Okay. okay. Um, number of questions, not exactly the same, but more or less saying that we've been told that in the past, if we start to feel pain, you describe the difference though, but um, we might be killing our motor neurons. And how can we really be sure that we haven't gone too far? 
you mentioned, but perhaps they're kind of like a little bit recognition of where do you stop? Well, let me um, let me ask you this one. Um, if you're if they were worried about damage of yes. the nerve cells, Second. yeah. Well, the first thing is that is a primarily a concern if the pain is in the muscle. Okay, it's not joint pain. It's not tendon attachment pain. It's in the muscle flesh belly. Okay, and it's a pain that is it could be quite severe. You know, it's usually quite achy, sometimes a bit burny. Okay tender a little bit at the time when it's bad to squeeze, but there should be a clear relationship that that pain is worse when you've used the muscle, okay, for very much, okay, or repetitively for an activity, and it should improve, maybe not go away, but it should improve when you've really rested and not done anything with it, okay? That's ways to say that is muscle pain, okay? Bec and the reason I differentiate that is because if you have that kind of activity-related rest improving, achy pain in, or sharp pain in the muscle belly, then that is m likely, if you're a polio survivor, that is very, very likely to be related to overuse, we say, of, the, of that muscle and overuse of the nerve, okay, that's driving, that controls the muscle, okay. And if you're using that too much on a repetitive basis, then you can get overuse weakness. You see, some of those nerve cells now can't handle it anymore. They start dropping out, they get sick. Uh, that the muscle tissue itself doesn't directly deteriorate, but that's where you potentially can damage the nerve. And that was described many years ago, even in the acute polio rehabilitation, and people six months and a year after it happened at Warm Springs by Dr. Bennett. Uh, they just pushed themselves too much, and all of a sudden, it got weaker, okay? But then when they rested it, it was able to come back. But that was their first big clue. A lot of the older polio survivors, in my experience, it sneaks up on them. It's not quite that dramatic, okay? But the best sign for it is that achy pain in the muscle. Uh, no, I don't have answer. much else to offer other than I would say that uh, I'd be careful about folks who, who do about rest being the answer, uh, that, that again, in, in this population, generally folks have a tendency to really overdo. And, and, and I think the answer is not overdoing. Clearly, that's a bad idea, and, and most would accept that. But, but underdoing is also a problem. And so simply resting uh, oftentimes, again, leads to frustration, which is a short-term fix, and then people overdo it again. And so I would just moderate and try and find out where that line is so you're not overdoing it or underdoing it. And, and we also like nice little package and say, okay, well, like I can't do this, and so I have to do nothing. I, I just not, that's just not reality. Reality is that difficult place where every day there are decisions about what's appropriate, what's causing harm, and what's helping, and that's right where I think we're at with this, in my opinion. Well, I wasn't advocating rest. No, I, was, no, no, I, no. I was only saying that was a way of telling that's what no, it was. You, what, you said, what you said was completely consistent with I was just, the, con, the, way, the word was, the question was worded, yeah, uh, made right. this kind of dichotomy. Well, it makes it hard once you know what that is, yeah. because then you have to say, you don't want to keep going to that point, but then you've got to, you're generally up against looking at a different way of doing something. Yes. You say you're cutting down on what you're doing it, but you don't want to just rest and, continuously, because then working, you get weaker. And working smarter, not harder. Exactly. Okay. Well said. All right, um, this has to do with the various testing that people have had, especially the EMGs, and winding up uh, assumption that it's carpal tunnel syndrome and wanting surgery, when in fact there's some hesitancy by uh, some that it might be like a polio nerve damage. I can vouch for that for myself. I questioned the, the indication that, oh yeah, I needed surgery. A neurologist confirmed that I didn't and put me on wearing actually a neck brace at night, and that relieved a, a lot of the tingling. But you're the doctors, please explain. <laughs> well, you, I just you do, have to say. You do EMG all the time, too, don't you? I mean, I, I, yes, I do it yes. all the time now. Can, can I give me a quick ahead, one? Yeah, no, I, right, right, Fred, Fred was just saying, I don't do EMGs any no, longer. I wasn't sure. and, and, and so, but I want to give you that perspective, and then Fred's sure. going to give you the, the, the perspective of one who does them. I, I the reason I stopped doing them is I was working in a hospital where we had a dozen physiatrists. I was managing a spinal cord unit, busier than could be, and, and, and half these guys were board certified electromyographers. 
they did a very quality job. And so when I was seeing somebody and kind of doing a couple here and a couple there and I had a big question, I talked to them and I kind of finally realized, you know what, they're going to do a better job. And so I like to think I'm a fairly bright guy and I could do a good job, and I'm sure I was doing a good job, but I wasn't doing a great job. And so I said, I want to just refer them, and that's how I just kind of got away from doing them. I say that because electromyography is very user dependent. And, and you have states where physical therapists can, and my wife is a physical therapist, I'm not knocking physical therapists, <laughs> but, but physical therapists are not trained from the diagnostic standpoint and EMGs can be done and you can see and they do every muscle and every nerve and it's a shotgun approach and when you get all that information you get a, a poor result. So I, I'm competent at looking at EMG reports and saying, and sometimes you can look from across the room and you can say, I don't believe that EMG. Um, but Fred's EMG, I would. <laughs> so now I'll let Thank you talk. You. <laughs> well, I would say, you know, because I've faced that problem, okay, uh, uh, and it does relate to the quality of the person doing it. They have to understand polio. If it's a polio survivor, they have to do the EMG in a way that you can tell this is from old polio or this is from something new. I would say a good electromographer, a really qualified electromographer, can do that at least 95% of the time. There will be cases where you could be still a little uncertain as to which it is, okay? But, and the second thing is, you can say you've got a combination. Remember, a polio survivor could have both, okay? There was old polio nerve damage, and they have carpal tunnel because carpal tunnel will affect the sensory nerve and cause numbness. Polio never did, okay? Did not cause numbness, okay? So there are lots of ways to tell that apart. Now, having said the fact that you now have carpal tunnel, the stretch is, is the carpal tunnel bad enough that you need surgery for it? You see, that's a whole different judgment issue than the electromographer who says, you definitely have carpal tunnel syndrome. I see people all the time that I do studies on, they got carpal tunnel, polars or otherwise, and I say, but I don't think, I wouldn't do that. I've had carpal tunnel for how many years? You know what I mean? I know it well. I haven't had any surgery done it for 30 years. I've been able to live with it. So here's the long list of other things you can do. There are occasionally some patients I see, this, your carpal tunnel is really bad. I would strongly recommend you get that thing fixed, or this is what's going to happen. And maybe that's okay. The person's 85. You know, do they really care <laughs> if their thumb is weak and they don't do too much? I mean, honestly, you know, so you have to put it in a clinical perspective. Which is a slightly different issue, we had no, about do you need true. surgery or not. Yeah, it, it's, an, it's another <laughs> example of making sure that you get another opinion if you're not comfortable with what you get. It's not the, just the test. No, the, there are two, three others. One other, other real quick one I just, comment. Just be sure, <laughs> I, I would recommend be sure the person is board certified in electromyography. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and that's how you that's can tell. That's one you qualification to relative to the yes. test. Yeah. I'd go somewhere else. <laughs> okay. Now, here's an ex um, many times we've been reading about the importance of getting our, our shingles vaccine, uh, di vaccination, I should say. Um, and this is a question that, that uh, some of the people have come down with shingles, and because of the problems that we've had, they do have mm -hmm. some of the neuralgia, the, the muscle problems. They want to know, is there any... Uh, hope uh, or anything specific that they could do now to help themselves? With shingles pain or they, to prevent that's, it? They've got the, uh, the neural, uh, neuralgia. The neuralgia, yeah, yes. right. Um, I don't think the polio, I, think, I wouldn't treat a polio survivor with post-shingles, what we call a post-herpetic neuralgia, any different than I would anyone else with post-herpetic neuralgia. Uh, if you're interested in that topic, you know, the, what was the issue about six months ago? We had, uh, I wrote an article for the Polio Health yeah. Network News yeah. on the results of shingles vaccination, and it certainly looks like aging polio survivors do just as well as the general population. It's just as safe, it's just as effective. 
But remember, even in the general population, shingles vaccine is not 100% effective. It does not guarantee you won't still get shingles, and, okay? And these people have gotten the shingles with the resulting muscle problems. Muscle problems. It shouldn't cause a muscle problem again, though, you see. Yeah. that It should cause, and I don't know, the, the, again, it was not an exhaustive study and uh, uh, that you can draw total conclusions from, but uh, it did appear, and that's one thing the shingles vaccine does seem to be good at, is it makes the chances, it, you'll still get shingles maybe, but you won't get that pain after shingles, okay? The post, that long, persistent, horrible nerve type of pain. I'm not familiar, I personally have not seen anyone and nobody in that survey response thing that we did for PHI wrote in and said they had new weakness no, this is, after they got, the... They didn't get the vaccine. Right. In fact, they came down with shingles, with shingles. before... Yeah. But did they get weakness from it? Uh, it's indicated that, okay. yes. They've had if they that. have, I just have not... I have seen that in non-polios okay. that had not only awful pain, but they actually... Because rare, rare cases, rare, I'm talking quite rare, so rare that m most of the people in my area didn't know it, yeah. including the neurologist, even though I had known it from, because I've been at a university, but uh, it shingles, uh, it, with neuralgia, you can get involvement of anterior horn cells and see weakness. I have not personally, I said, heard of or had an experience with a polio survivor where that happened, but okay. there's a lot of you out there and somebody could have. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, this is- Talk to me afterward, we'll ask that question if um, you want more. There was, um, you were indicating, well, both of you had, of get, making sure that you get a good analysis of uh, treating physician, uh, physical therapy, rest, and the medication, and it's indication that all of this does take time. You might have to see more than one specialist, and there's a feeling that some say, I just don't have time to do all this. Um, then the problem's not that bad. <laughs> And, and that sounds, and, and that, that, that sounds like a trite answer, but, but that's, that's an accurate yes, answer. Yes, it is. Uh, and, and so that's where the chronic disease self-management comes yeah. in setting goals, what's important in my life, and, and, and what is inhibiting me from doing the things that are important. And uh, as a rehab physician, I go back to when I did inpatient rehab, and if I had admitted somebody who, uh, we both would admit people who you know, literally were struck by trains. I mean, they just got, <laughs> you know, there's a long list of problems. And, and we don't try and fix everything. I mean, you're, you're very thorough, you, you get a list of all the issues that are going on, and then you pick out the ones that are the most important limiting progress today. And we, we're gonna knock those off, and guess what? When we knock off some of those, by the time we get down to the bottom list, a lot of those issues have gone away. So, uh, yeah, I would focus on the things that are the biggest problem, and it's not a big problem. And, and that's a problem in medicine today, I believe, is, is that we feel like we have to fix everything. And that's, I, I like to, to, to differentiate between something that's a nuisance versus something that's a problem. And we don't have to fix every nuisance in our life, and in fact, that's not gonna happen. And so we focus on things that are problems that are functionally limiting us in what we wanna get done in the day. Last one, I'd like to try to squeeze in and kind of put it all together. Uh, this has to do with um, different medications or side effects. Uh, and I'll, I'll read them all quickly and you can kind of answer. Um, explain any long-term effects of clorazepam, I can't pronounce it, clorazepam uh, to use to treat uh, spasms. Is there any long-term effect? Because that's one of those that sometimes has been recommended for. Clonazepam. Yeah, I, I'm. I, yeah, I'm not a real fan. Uh, you know, I, I would much rather look at, uh, at at flexibility exercises, strengthening exercises. There, there are muscle relaxant medications in other classes, um, but there are cognitive effects to that. There are set of effects, and I have, I myself have seen enough times where uh, medications like that can subtly affect someone's cognition. And I learned that in in a patient early on who was a straight A student. And, and started getting Bs, even though she felt fine. And I started saying, you know, what are we doing? You know, we're knocking people down a, a notch and, and their ability to think. And these are sedative medications. They do not just act on the, on the muscle. They act by sedating your central nervous system. And I, for short-term use, there's a role. Uh, I just tend to stay away. Okay. Uh, I, I was just gonna say, I would even be more, I, I don't disagree, but I would even go further as to say, you, you, 
There isn't a role for clonazepam in, in chronic muscle spasm. You're doing something wrong if it's got to be. I'd be much more blunt. No, honestly. <laughs> and, right. and even if you don't think you're fatigued by it, okay, uh, then, then you're basically habituated to it. It is not meant to, you know, it's an anxiety disorder medication, okay. Yes, it has a role to play short term in some post-injury kinds of spasm issues. You got to, that person who's on that chronically needs to get into a long-term relaxation. They may need to look, get into yoga. They need to maybe work with a psychologist. How am I, my tension in life is all going into my muscles. There's something wrong, okay? And they need flexibility exercises, but it, you want to avoid that. Honestly, it is just not like a good approach. Yeah. Okay, muscle relaxants had two questions. One is uh, taking muscle relaxants at night. How can, is that possible to still take sleeping pills? And the other was uh, concern about muscle relaxants. You've often heard that that can cause even more weakening of the muscles. Yeah, and chronic pain too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that, uh, that, that I'll address the latter. I'll, 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 but, but, but yeah, you know, in terms of, the, of, the, of the, the, the sleep issues and sleep medications, first of all, you might not need the other sleep medication, and certainly you never want to take more medications than you need. But whenever you have medications that might have sedation as a side effect, there is always, always, always the potential for an additive effect. And so you, you need to be careful. I mean, that's completely true. So you start with a lower dose, or you, you hold the other medication and reintroduce it at a lower dose. Some, some people might do fine on both. Uh, some might, uh, might, might be overly sedated. Um, if you're at appropriate doses of a sleep medication and a muscle relaxant, you, uh, it, it's, it's, it's hard to see that you're going to be doing any kind of permanent harm. You might wake up the next morning and say, you know, I'm not going to do that again. And so you might not want to do that the day before you go into work or you have a very important meeting or something like that. But, uh, and I, I have the whole talk on sleep, um, uh, but, my, my, but sleep is really, really, really important when it comes to muscle spasm and muscle pain. And so there is a, certainly a role for muscle relaxants that may have some set sedating effect on an individual where that side effect can actually be a benefit because the person's not up countless hours at night getting sleep deprived, which then feeds into more muscle spasm. So that, that side effect can actually be a benefit. Um, and, and yes, you want to be careful if you're also on a sleep medication, but, but it's not completely contraindicated. But Bill, wouldn't you say that the, uh, the only other comment uh, is if you're, you, if you're a poly survivor and you're using, need to use a muscle relaxant, okay, in part at night for sleep, then you've got to be very, very certain that it's not going to negatively affect breathing issues. Whether yes. it be sleep apnea or hypoventilation, because yeah. as a polar survivor, you're very subject to that. And that will make it worse. You see, those breathing problems will be made worse by that muscle spasm. So that's the thing you really have to go out of your way to be sure it's not going to make that issue, particularly that issue. Sure. Worse. Yeah. We've gone over, but I just wanted to try to cover as many questions that uh, these people had. You did a great had. job, man. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank You two covered a fantastic amount of information. <laughs> wow. I mean, wow. I didn't, I mean, nobody That's was yawning awesome. and everybody was watching. Are you? Oh. Hi.